Well, good morning, Burnett family. Thank you so much for joining us again online. We're really happy to be here with you this morning. Uh, one quick thing I want to explain that will become super self-evident in just a moment. Uh, you're going to notice that we're not posting uh, worship videos with our sermons anymore. Uh, there's just been a lot of changes and things that have moved on. And so we decided, look, for the, the next season of time, we're not going to add those pre-done videos that we have. What we would encourage you to do is if you're looking for worship at home is to go online. There's so many great worship resources from lots of churches that we sing songs of here at Burnett. We would just encourage you to look up a playlist, check in, don't give up the habit of worshiping. Uh, we're just not going to provide it on these videos for the next little while, okay? If you have any questions about that, something that you're concerned about or need a little bit of clarity on, just email Pastor Jordan or myself. We'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, in the meantime, we did want to let you know that on the 26th of June, we're going to have a team day. Uh, and so if you are serving in any capacity at the church or interested in getting involved in serving in the next little while, you should come out to Team Day. Team Day is a great place to hear a little bit of vision for myself about where the church overall is going and things that are important to us, but also to break out with some of those serving teams and get to know other people that you might serve with and hear a little bit of that uh, leader's heart for their ministry and get a little bit of training buffed up as well. So uh, the 26th, we would like for you to register. Registration should be up on our website already. You can go there and let us know that you're going to come. For now, let me pray. And then uh, we've got a great message this week from Pastor Jordan for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for these friends, for this community, uh, for the opportunity that we have to engage each other even when we're at a distance. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would come and you would speak to us now through your word, uh, through this message that you've given Jordan, just to penetrate our hearts, have your way in our lives, uh, do with us what you would want to do this week. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. For those of you who are new, my name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited to be with you on this beautiful, gloomy, <laughs> surprisingly raining Sunday morning in June. Anybody else just like so over the weather? Like, I'm just like, I'm just so dumb. I'm not originally from BC, and so I'm like, nope. Like I signed up for this in October through February. Maybe March, maybe April, but it's like, that's it. <laughs> so I'm just waiting for the weather people to um, get in into gear. I assume they're the ones that control this. Um, I don't know how this works, but uh, get it together. Uh, before I get into uh, anything else, I just want to um, honor just a few people. Um, this is Gwen and Richard Champagne's last um, Sunday with us. And for those of you who don't know um, Gwen and Richard, Gwen was serving um, you coffee this morning. Um, she was the, the kind, gentle looking one that didn't look like Ernie. And then Richard is our predominant sound man. He's back at the booth right now. They're moving to Edmonton, and we are, we are so sad. I, I took it upon myself because I, I love Gwen and Richard deeply. Um, Gwen's involved in our seniors ministry. Um, she helped with the luncheon. She serves coffee. And Richard comes in on a regular basis and, you know, rearranges the stage, does all the sound stuff, makes it all happen. And I, I love Richard enough to tell him that I hope he's absolutely miserable in Edmonton so he moves back. Um, because if I didn't like him, I'd be like, hey, have a great time. Like, I hope life's great. Um, but I love him enough to say that, you know, I hope you guys move back. But, you know, without joking any further, honestly, um, Burnett's going to miss you guys. We love you guys so, so deeply. Um, and we pray and wish nothing but the best. Um, for you and whatever church we, um, we sow you into, um, because we're not just letting you go, we believe we're sowing you into a place um, is going to be so fantastically blessed by everything that you do and all that you serve. So thank you guys so much for serving so well. Yeah. All right, so we're in a series called A New World, and uh, we've, been, we've been diving through um, Sermon on the Mount, so Matthew 5 through 7, and so Tim has done uh, the majority of the lifting in this series, and so he kind of tossed me um, just like, I guess, the language that he's been using, which is always like interesting to me, and he's not here to defend himself, and so it's like he uses the word like spicy meatball, and like in the back in my mind, I'm just like, I'm like, a spicy meatball, like it's just like... The, 
It's so funny. And so he, he tossed me over Matthew 6, and we're going to go through 1 through 24. Uh, I'm going to do, as I normally do, read a very large passage of Scripture and do my best to kind of like work through it for the next two hours with you. Um, I'm kidding. You'll be out by 11.15 at the latest. Um, and so if you have your Bibles or devices or um, whatever you consume Scripture on, because I just assume that you're consuming Scripture, um, and I'm not the only one. This is what this passage is actually about. There's a lot of assumptions that Jesus makes here, and so I don't think it's a stretch for me to do it either. But I'll, I'll read it to you, and hopefully you'll follow along. Um, it contains things you've heard before, um, some of the most famous passage of Scripture in all of the Bible. And so whether you know it or not, this is that piece. So be careful not to practice righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, see, that's like language of assumption. So when, it's like assuming that you're doing these things. It's not just, um, hey, if you do it, or if you decide to, it's like, hey, when, like when you do this. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets. To be honored by others, truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let the left hand know what the right hand is doing, so that, you may gi- so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees it, what is done in secret, will reward you. Verse 5. And when you pray, same language, when you pray, Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and out on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask." Then this is how you pray. And, you know, this is going to be a very familiar passage of Scripture, whether this is um, your first time in church, first time in church in a long time, or if you've never been to church before, but you just um, grew up in an era where you sang O Canada and said the Our Father before every day of school. Because I remember when that stopped in my lifetime. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we, as we also have been forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others for their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. It continues on in verse 16 and goes right back to that language. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their face and show others their fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin and thieves will break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart there is also. The eye is a lamp into the body. For your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then great light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. For you cannot serve both God and money. Let's pray. Father, would you be with us? Would you speak to us? Um, As we... Read your word. Can we look at this and can we, can we apply this to our lives, to our culture, to our family? Can we look at what you're doing in, in us? And so, Lord, we say, have your way in this place, in Burnett, as it is in heaven. In your name I pray. Amen. See, when we look at Matthew chapter 6, um, there's, like I was saying, there's some assumptions that there's three topics that are passing on here. And there's assumption about there's three topics. And so um, those three topics are around giving, they're around praying, and they're around fasting. See, as we continue in this passage, we jump, uh, jump into the topics that can potentially be uh, like contentious, if you would. They can, they can be problematic or stumbling blocks in, in the modern church. At least um, the first one, that idea of giving. 
There's an underlying subtext within Matthew chapter 6. So he talks about giving, he talks about praying, and he talks about fasting. But then there's this underlying undertone, there's an underlying subtext that, that comes into this, and that's all of these things are purely matters of the heart. All of these things are purely matters of the heart. And, and we'll break this down. See, uh, when it comes to giving, let me, let me put it this way. You give to things that you care about. You give to things that you care about. I can tell what you care about if you hold up your credit card statement to me. Because what you spend your money on, you see value in. Like if you have a Netflix, a Disney Plus, an Amazon Prime, a Crave subscription, what do you value? Entertainment. There's an inherent value of entertainment, which is why you pay for all of those subscriptions. You know, I've always wondered, like, how Netflix makes money, because, like, everyone just shares a password. Like, how do they make money with, like, one password shared amongst millions of people? Like, you laugh, but I actually use my old youth pastor's, like, password from Ottawa. I'm not kidding. I pay for Disney+. Plus. But if you show me your credit card, I, I can tell you what you value. If I begin to see Cactus Club, Earl's, Black Sheep, like whatever it is, like if I begin to see those things, I was like, what do you value? Oh, this person values food. They value going out to eat. Where your treasure is, your... I can see you, what you value by what you give to. See, when you, you give to the things that you actually care about. Now, it's interesting within the church when we talk about giving because, you know, so often I think giving can be a taboo subject. Like, oh, here's the pastor again just asking for money. That's not this message. I'm not here asking for a cent. I'm not here asking for, for, for your money. I'm here asking for your heart because that's what the scripture says. And this isn't, hey, you guys need to tithe. We'll talk about that in a bit, but like, that's not what this is. See, it's interesting because you can give money to the church as purely a financial benefit. Because the church is a charity, we have a nonprofit status, so when you give, there's a, there's, a tax, there's a tax benefit to giving to the church. And so some people within, like, they look for where they can give their money so that it actually benefits them financially. You guys are tracking with me? So that is a, a possible avenue, and they look for vehicles in which they do. That is why people give to charities, like just like business people, people that like are affluent, or like just anybody in general. They look for charities that they can funnel their money through because it's either give it to them or give it to the government. But at least when you give it to them, you get some of it back. I don't fully understand how that works, but you can talk to Kevin. <laughs> or don't. So there is some benefit to giving to, to the church, but again, that's, that's not what this, we're talking about here. I'm talking about the heart behind things, because let me, let me say it like this, and maybe this will bring some more clarity to it. Uh, you can give without caring, but you can't care without giving. People can give without caring because they understand, you know, one and two is three, and so it makes sense to do it, but you can't care without giving. Because where your treasure is, your heart is there also. So if your heart's somewhere, the natural byproduct is going to be your treasure. See, it was interesting when um, one of my former employers, uh, I got pulled into an exec team member's office, and they sat me down, and, they, and, and I appreciate this, and it was strange, but I appreciate it because I, I, I really value, and it's ironic, uh, because I, I am one, I really value good pastoral care. Uh, it's a high priority for myself, so I value good pastoral care, and so when I experience good pastoral care, it's, 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 I'm like, oh, this is a good thing, like, you're doing a good thing. And so I got, sat down in, in one, of the, one of the exec's offices, and they said, hey, Jordan, we noticed that you're not giving. And I was like, oh, it's kind of like a strange conversation, but like, good on you. That's super bold to like, you know, go and look at the giving record and be like, you're a staff member and you're not giving. 
And so I, I, I kind of looked at them. I was like, actually, like, I am. But I purposely wasn't writing my name on the envelopes. And I was giving in cash because I was just in this moment where I just really felt, I was like, I wanted to give, and I wanted to give with zero benefit to myself because I wanted to give sacrificially. And it was in that moment, and they're like, okay, like, we believe you. Like, that's the base assumption of, like, working within churches. It's like, we're, we believe you. Can you start putting your name on it? And I was like, okay, like, yeah, I can, no problem at all. Start putting my name on it. And I valued it because it was good pastoral care, and they cared about me enough because they would say to me, they, didn't, like, they, they knew what I was getting paid. And so, like, it's not the benefit of the dollar amount, but it was they're like, hey, we want you, like, we want you on mission with us. And, like, you're helping, like, run this thing. We want you on mission with us. And so that was a high-value moment where I was like, oh, like, they're not saying this because they want my money. They're saying this because they want my investment. They want, they want my heart. But when this passage of Scripture is using language of don't let the left know what the right is doing is the context that this is written to in Matthew is that there was collection boxes in the synagogues. And it was Jewish custom of the collection of alms. And alms simply meaning um, money designated towards the poor. And so what would happen here is when it says, don't let the, let the left know what the right is doing, it was Jesus addressing the religious rhetoric of constantly people showboating about their giving. Like, that's, like, this language. If, like, it could be, like, you know, it'd be, like, the difference of, like, you know, writing a check and, like, just putting it in the box versus, like, you know, just, like, one of these. Like. <laughs> like, that's, like, what was happening in the synagogue where it's, like, you know, instead of, like, doing like a crisp 20, it's like, let me get it all in pennies and pour it out. It's like, okay, you're, just like, you're being dramatic. And so when it says like the left know what the right is doing, it's because like, you know, here at Burnett, like we don't pass a plate. We just got a giving kiosk set up. And the only reason we got a giving kiosk set up is because like there was a deep need of like, people would come in and be like, hey, like I don't know how to set up online giving. I don't know how to do anything. It was, it was simply, and it sounds funny, like setting that up was simply out of trying to serve our people and serve our church. It wasn't because, like, oh, if we set up a giving kiosk, like, all of a sudden, like, finances are going to go, like, out of control. People are going to be like, oh, giving kiosk, sign me up. Like, it's not how that works. It was simply a way to serve the people. But when it says in this context, so like, when we look at Scripture and we're looking at how this works and applies to our life, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't that idea of how do, like, how do I showboat it. It's the, the, don't let the left know what the right is doing. It's pure language of, like, hey, like, you know, Give and give to your own. And when I read this, that's why I was giving with, with not writing a check on it. Because I was like, no, like, you know, I want this as a holy moment between, like, my God and myself. And I didn't want there to be benefit of, of anything. But, you know, at that time, like, I wasn't making enough for, like, to be any benefit. It was like, cool, like, 20 bucks. Like, awesome. It's, it's, it's funny because when, when we read this, it just comes back to that idea of Jesus saying, hey, I want, I want your heart. I want your heart. Now, there's maybe some contention about the idea of giving within the church. Do you give a tithe? What is a tithe? Is a tithe old covenant? Do I have to give? That's not the sermon. Like, that's not what this is. I'm not here saying this is what a tithe is, this is what it is. I, like, I know what I believe, and I challenge you to go and do your research. But when I was starting my youth ministry from the ground up, I asked every single one of my youth leaders uh, who, was, who were building culture and building this with me, and I, before we ever had a youth meeting, I sat with them all and I said, hey, guys, I'm going to be very upfront with this. I don't care how much, but I want you to give financially to this ministry because I want your heart. And I was like, I don't care if it's $5. I don't care if it's $5,000. Like, whatever it is. But I want you to give to this because I want you to care about this. Because what you care about, you give to. 
And I think that's, the, that's, that's important when we understand this because you can give without caring, but you can't care without giving. And I wanted people that I was serving alongside, linking arms with building and working with the youth of our city. I said, hey, like, I don't just want you to show up on a Tuesday night. I want you to care and die for this ministry. And so that's why I, didn't, I not only asked for their money, but I was ultimately asking for their heart. And so this isn't me saying, church, we need to step up financially. This is me saying, church, we need to be better disciples. And giving manifests itself in multiple ways. It's not just, hey, cut a check. But it's, hey, give your time. Do what the worship team does. Give your talents. Do what Richard does. Give your talents. There's so much more than just the financial aspect of it. Giving manifests itself in multiple ways where it's time, talent, and treasures. And so people that come in on a regular basis and sacrifice their time, that's a significant sacrifice. Like, we, like you know, let's be honest. You all have better things to do. And maybe I just think too highly of yourself, but like, you have better things to do. But people would come in and say, no, I'm going to lay my time, my freedom, my moments down for the sake of others. Because that's important. See, there's, again, these assumptions when we continue on to read, when it talks about prayer, it says, when you pray. See, the book of Matthew was primarily written to a Jewish audience. And so that's why there's these underlying assumptions with it, because within Jewish customs, the Jews prayed three times a day. And it was, and it was, and it was, and it was a religious act. And not a religious act is a bad thing, but it was like, this is what they did. It's like those people that no matter what will say grace before dinner. They haven't gone the doors of a church or opened their Bible in 25 years, but without fail, grace happens before a meal. And this is, this is what the Jewish people did. They, they prayed three times a day. And this is why context matters. Because when it says, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. is because this, this prayer, this language of prayer is around corporate prayer. See, when they prayed three times a day, it wasn't uncommon for the Jewish people to head to the synagogue, to go to the temple. We see that throughout scripture with Jesus. Where he says, I'm going to go to the temple to pray. Because that was normal custom. That was a regular thing that would actually happen. But there was the potential for showmanship and bragging. And so when it talks about this, and it, it, it was the appearance, or people would appear to have like some form of super spirituality. Where people would begin to look at them and be like, oh, that guy's like super spiritual. And so the language of what this is saying in Matthew chapter 6 is, is like when it comes to super prayer, but it was, but it was ultimately a heart issue. Because prayer in itself is like such a beautiful and wonderful thing. But if you're just praying for the showmanship, it, it talks about this. And it says, you know, truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full. And this is where the text gets interesting because it says, do it in secret and your father will reward you. And so it talks about their reward or his reward. And so there's different things that happen. So like when people boast and, and, and have that showmanship or that idea of uh, spirituality, their reward is simply the recognition of like, oh, wow, they're spiritual. Which is like, what a raw deal. Like, that's terrible. Like, I would hate for somebody to think that of me. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, but like that idea, like, okay, I'll just go there. As a pastor, I, I'm like, I hope that there's no like misnomer of like that I'm super spiritual. And I say that because I've stood on this platform and I stand on it again, saying multiple, multiple times that I'm a severely broken, hurting, dysfunctional human. I just have a deep love for Christ, his church, some schooling, and say, hey, let's do this together. But in no form have I ever tried to paint the picture that Pastor Jordan is more spiritual than anybody else. So, like, as a pastor, please don't hold me to that standard. Because I will fail you. I'm going to totally let you down if this idea of, like, I'm more spiritual than somebody else. 
I'm just deeply committed to the way of Christ and trying to figure it out together. But like to say life is just like, I got it figured out and I know the answer. Oh man, that's like, guys, like I'm 31. <laughs> like, I have no, like, I say I don't know what I don't know. And like, I barely know the things I do know. So, like, this idea of having, like, a deep spirituality, it's like, no, like, I'm just trying to pursue Christ and literally invite as many people that I can to do it with me. And I think, like, that's the beautiful thing that we're forming and shaping here at Burnett is that we use language of a come-as-you-are community, and that goes for pastors as well. Where I could could stand up here and say, like, you know, guys, like, life has been brutal for my past six weeks. But I can stand here and say, you know, I serve a God who is so gracious and so kind. And I'm okay not being okay. Because I think before in the past, pastors just have an expectation of like, we just need to have it all together. But like, I'm weary of people that have it all together. Like, do you live in a vacuum? Like, how do you just have everything together at all moments? Like, don't get me wrong, life goes great sometimes. Like, I mean, I've never had a bad day at Disneyland. I'm sorry. Like, it just hasn't happened. I had a season pass for four years. It hasn't happened. Like, it's just one of those things. I've never had a bad day at Disney. I've seen people have bad days at Disney. Like, you know, kids are crying. I'm like, get your crap together. Like, this is the happiest place on earth. (laughs) Wasn't my kid, but I'm thinking it to myself. I'm like, go see Mickey. Like, what's wrong with you? But as a pastor, it's like, you know, there's, there's no mystery that we're here to love and care and shepherd but it's also like hey like we're also figuring this out and you know let's just do this together in this community but what Jesus warns is the heart issue of like if we try to stand up here and say hey you know I'm super spiritual I got life figured out like hey you know like all that it's like it's he Matthew said hey like don't do that like if you want to do that that's your reward of them putting you on that pedestal But the text says, like, hey, like, go pray and meet God in secret and you'll get his reward. And, like, I say, like, I don't know a lot, but, like, I know, like, what I can produce is significantly less valuable than what, like, God of the universe can produce. Amen? And so it's, like, when it's, like, oh, man, like, my reward, his reward, my reward, his reward. It's, like, like, I'm hoping I'm going to take his reward every time. Because that's what this text is saying. It's just that idea where we can come together and have it. And as we continue to read, we get into the most famous prayer ever written. And I'm not going to get into the Lord's Prayer because I could actually spend like six to eight weeks here because I, like, I love it so deeply. And it's language that I use in my everyday life. But I'm not, I'm not going gonna, gonna to get into the nuance of the Lord's Prayer. But I was talking about the context of the book of Matthew and how the Jewish people would pray three times a day. And so when the Lord gives him, when Jesus instructs him, then he says, when you pray, say this. And he gives it to them. That's very traditional in Jewish customs. Because they would have set prayers for the morning. They'd have set prayers for noon. And they'd have set prayers for for evening. It's why in, in, in Christendom, in history, and more in the Catholicism, we have prayer books Like preset prayers that people will open and pray. And so I'm not talking about the idea that the Lord's Prayer is a model. Yes. And I won't go for the next six to eight weeks there. But we're going to talk about this is a great and wonderful and a holy thing to pray. In that exact form. And that's why he gave that to the Jewish people, because he, he was flipping the, the idea of religion on its head and saying, you know, those are good things, but let me give you something that is also better. And he sets it out for them. So this is contextually applicable to Jewish people as well as the Gentiles, as well as the secular. He was like, this is good. Pray like this. And like I said, I'm not going to get into to the idea of the Lord's Prayer, but it's remembering that it was the subtext of it's all just this idea of it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And there's that assumption when you pray, not if, but when. When you give, not if, but when. And then it goes into fasting. And it's the same principle, and I'm not going to stay on fasting too long. 
But it's the same principle where it says, hey, when you do it, do it in secret. For if you tell everyone, that's your reward. They get their reward. It's that language again. But if you do it in secret, you can get his reward. And it's that idea of fasting when you do it. Like he, when he says, like, put oil on your head and, and, and wash your feet. Like, that's just modern day. He's like, hey, take a shower. Like, like put some pomade in your hair. Like, comb it at least. Like, don't just walk around and be, oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, like, why are you hungry? I'm fasting. <laughs> Abstaining from, like, calm down. The whole idea of fasting is to set aside natural needs to press into a deep spiritual sense. It's, it's a constant rec- recognition. What's the one thing you always remember when you're hungry? Is that you're hungry? And, like, you start, like, your belly hurts sometimes because, like, you have that hunger. And it's in those moments where there's a beautiful desire of saying no to yourself and no to your desires, even though those desires are naturally good. And saying, no, I'm going to fill myself with the word of the Lord. I'm going to fill myself with the presence of God. And this isn't a call to do, you know, go on a 40-day water fast or like anything like that. But this is just a beautiful thing. And it's, and it's the assumption as disciples. That's the word. As disciples. When you give. When you pray. And when you fast. And then we finally get towards the end of our text. Don't store up things on earth you can take with you. A man can't serve two masters. He can't serve God and money. You know, I had this, in studying this and then looking at it, I had a very, very interesting um, realization. Not a trick question. How many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. Not a trick question. Then he had his three. And so we see a biblical account of Jesus calling 12 disciples. Where he goes to them and says, hey, follow me. Did you know that there was a 13th? There's a biblical account of a 13th person being interacted one-on-one with Jesus. And he says, come and follow me. It's found in Matthew 19. Jesus answers him. If you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then follow me. It's the rich young ruler. Jesus goes to the rich young ruler and invites him with the same invitation that he gave James, Peter, and John. It's the same invitation. Go and follow me. But then when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. What's so fascinating, and I just like, I've been thinking about this for weeks now is that this man went down nameless in history, sad, with the same invitation that Peter, James, and John had. Like, think about that. The same invitation as the person who started the modern church, the half-brother of Jesus, and the person who wrote the book of John and the book of Revelations. That invitation was to the rich young ruler as well, and we don't even know his name. This is a heart issue. It has nothing to do with what you give. It has nothing to do with how you pray, and it has nothing to do with how often you fast. All of those are simply pertaining to that idea of, I want your heart. That's what Matthew 6 is saying. He says, no, no, like, I, but then it's the instruction on how do, you, how do you give Jesus your heart? Well, if you're doing, there's that assumption. If you're doing those three things, if you care, you can't help but give, pray, and fast. It's so interesting. So when I look at my life and I look at how I'm doing, I use that as a barometer. How am I giving? How am I praying? And how am I fasting? Because those are markers of a disciple of Christ. And that's the call, is to be a disciple. The call is to follow Jesus. 
And so when I look at this, it's like, oh man, it's like, I need to, I need to connect my heart to this. That's an important, it's an important thing. And so as a church, we ask the question, how can you give time, talent, or treasures? How do you get involved in prayer? How is your private prayer life? We have corporate prayer on Thursday mornings for men at 6 a.m. And every week it's still a sacrifice for me to get up. Like, I hate mornings. Like, that's not an understatement. But, it, but it's worth it and it's beneficial for me because it's priority. This is important. That's the call is Jesus saying, hey, I want your hearts. Because where your treasure is, your heart is there also. And so I'll leave you guys with that. I'll pray for you. We'll have a couple announcements. And then we'll be on our way. God, would you come and would you meet us exactly where we are? God, as we're confronted by the text of Matthew 6 that you left for us, as you were writing this to your people and even preaching this as a sermon, God, that we're confronted by this. Holy Spirit, we give you permission, I give you permission to work in my life, to, to, to draw me closer to you. God, would you reveal yourself more and more? God, would you reveal areas in moments that I can give more generously, that I can spend more time in your presence, and that I can remove things from my life and replace them with you? on a temporary basis, on a permanent basis. Lord, I just give you permission. Have your way. Have your way in whatever you want to do. God, that we can be confronted by this, that it's uncomfortable, but that's the goal is to, to seek you, to seek your face, that you'd move within us, that you'd move within your church. God, that you're moving Burnett forward, that the people in Maple Ridge and Pitt Meadows would come to know the reality and the glory of Jesus. So God, be with us today. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, folks, that's everything for this week. Again, thank you so much for engaging with us. As always, we want you to know, look, if you're not here, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to pray for you. So you can reach out and send any of our staff a note or even just our general info box. Uh, Tim at Burnett Church, Jordan at Burnett Church, Melissa at Burnett Church, info at Burnett Church. Send us an email any way you like. We would love to pick it up and get connected to you or just give us a phone call at the church during business hours. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much, everyone. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.